Hi, this is Nurse Inga, and you're watching a guided discussion on the hematology system. The hematologic system consists of blood, the cells, the lymph system that parallels the vascular system, and the organs involved in blood formation and blood storage. The blood itself consists of the plasma, the proteins, the electrolytes, and the cells that all circulate throughout the vascular system. The primary roles of the hematologic system include the circulation of oxygen, nutrients, hormones, and metabolic wastes. The system protects against the invasion of pathogens and maintains coagulation, fluid and acid-base balance, and body temperature. The average adult has roughly five to six liters of blood in their vascular system. The heart circulates the total volume every minute. Therefore, the average adult cardiac output is five to six liters per minute. This is a critical concept because if the blood volume or the number of oxygen carrying red blood cells decreases, the body compensates by increasing the heart rate to maintain an adequate cardiac output and circulating oxygen volume. Hematopoiesis is the process of forming, developing, and differentiating the different cells within the bloodstream. This occurs in the red marrow of bones. It's named red marrow because you can see the red blood cells giving it the color, but all blood cells are formed there. In adults, red marrow is present in flat and irregular bones. In children, red marrow is present in all bones and specifically the long bones. Stem cells in the marrow are referred to as pluripotent, meaning that they have the ability to become any of the blood cells. Hormones in the bloodstream signal the stem cells to become either lymphoid, which creates our T and B lymphocytes and uh, protects us by you know, growing our immune system, or myeloid. And our myeloid cells then differentiate into either red cells, white cells, or platelets. Red blood cells are referred to as erythrocytes. These carry oxygen and help with clot formation. When we have low red blood cells, we have what we call anemia, and therefore the patient cannot uh, transport enough oxygen to the cells of the body, and they have hypoxia. White blood cells are called leukocytes, and leukocytes fight infection, and they're part of the immune and inflammatory response. Someone who has low white blood cells has leukopenia, and they are at high risk for infection. Platelets are referred to as thrombocytes because they aggregate and clump together to form a thrombus or a, a clot. When somebody has low platelets, they have thrombocytopenia and they are at risk for bleeding. The spleen and the liver are accessory organs of blood formation. The spleen has both red and white pulp. The red pulp acts in the hematology side. The white pulp acts as part of the lymphatic system. So it's made up of both vascular and lymph tissue. It breaks down old blood cells and it also stores cells. So white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets are all stored within the spleen. The blood is filtered through constantly um, all day long and that the spleen recognizes old cells or any debris that is floating through and it filters it out and it breaks it down. So um, really it protects us from having um, any old uh, cells floating through the body that could break open and flood our system with excess bilirubin or potassium or other debris. Um, and it also recycles some of those pieces and parts to be used again um, in the formation of new cells. If the person has a problem with their spleen, if it's injured or if it's enlarged and it needs to be removed, the removal of that much, not only vascular, but lymphatic tissue puts them at a lifelong risk of infection and sepsis. The liver is also another very highly vascular organ, and it is responsible for the creation and storage of a lot of our clotting factors. Now, it creates um, a whole host of clotting factors, but specifically prothrombin is one of the ones that we're um, interested in, as well as the synthesis of vitamin K, because prothrombin is part of the clotting cascade 
that um, Coumadin specifically blocks, and vitamin K is the reversal agent for Coumadin. So prothrombin time is the blood test that we look at to see um, how well my blood is clotting, especially if I'm on an oral anticoagulant. And then vitamin K is the reversal if I'm over anticoagulated with oral uh, anticoagulants like Coumadin or Warfarin. The liver stores a large amount of blood and iron for uh, use in blood formation, red blood cell formation. And people who um, have chronic liver problems, such as hepatitis, cirrhosis, and liver cancer, will have problems with clotting and bleeding, and therefore they are at high risk for you know, uh, problems, increased problems with injury or with uh, injections and things like that. If the liver is not functioning properly or if there is an enhanced destruction of red blood cells and the bilirubin is being released into the bloodstream, we have uh, what's referred to as jaundice or icterus where the skin starts to turn yellow. Oftentimes we'll see it first in the sclera. So if you look in the eyes of your patient and you notice that the sclera of the eyes is yellow, you need to confirm, especially in somebody who has darkly pigmented skin, that in fact, this is a jaundice issue and not just a normal variation. So you confirm that by following up and checking in the palate of the mouth and under the tongue, the palms of the hands and overall the skin color. Hemostasis is the process of stopping bleeding, and this occurs in um, five steps. So first of all, there's damage to the vessel. This causes the release of uh, plasma and red and white cells into the surrounding tissues. This causes a chemical reaction, which causes the vessel to spasm for about an hour and restricts blood flow. And when the blood flow is restricted and the flow slows down, the body is able to form a platelet plug. This ha also has a chemical reaction, so there's a spasm and then platelet plug formation where platelets, von Wildebrand's factor, fibrin, and blood cells come together. The platelets change shape, they become spiky, they kind of all stick together, and as they're sticking together, they release other chemicals that attract more platelets uh, to them, and they form this big platelet plug. Then that kind of enacts the clotting cascade and um, fibrin and red cells um, join in the action and create this big clot. The clot then tightens or retracts and pulls the edges of the wound together. And at the same time, it releases a stimulant for growth factor where new cell growth in the lining of the epithelium is generated and the, um, vas the vessel will start to grow itself back together. And then after um, that is healed, the clot starts to break itself up. So that's called fibrinolysis or clot dissolution where um, it breaks itself up and the, the clot dissolves and the pieces and parts go back out into the bloodstream where they're cleaned up by the liver and the spleen and um, kind of reused if they can be. The hematologic assessment is critical as far as the nurse is concerned to determine whether or not there is a potential hematologic problem currently going on. We assess the age, gender, occupation, baseline liver, kidney, and bone health of our patient. If they have liver problems, they're at risk for bleeding. If they have some sort of bone problem, they're at risk for you know, marrow not producing blood cells. And if they have kidney failure, the kidney is where erythropoietin is um, stimulated and released, and erythropoietin is the hormone that triggers the creation of red blood cells. So kidney failure leads to anemia. Certain medications can increase red blood cell destruction or suppress bone marrow function. And so certain medications could lead to anemia. Um, medications also can impact um, with the bone marrow function, white blood cell and um, platelet counts. With nutrition, you wanna look at their dietary intake of kind of a healthy balanced diet, but are they getting enough vitamin K? Um, do they have a risk for anemia? And this would be like a high fat, high carb diet, low proteins, low vitamins, low iron. Look for a family history of clotting or bleeding disorders. 
and then talk to them about their current health problems to assess for signs and symptoms of hematologic disorders. And that would include things like swollen lymph nodes, easy bruising, and fatigue, which is like the number one sign and symptom of anemia. Your physical exam then would reinforce those findings, looking for any changes in the skin, including things like pallor, jaundice, petechiae, bruising. Um, different types of anemia present with things like fissures in the corner of the mouth, as well as glossitis or kind of a beefy red smooth tongue. Assess for tachycardia or tachypnea, signs of um, you know, increased heart rate and respiratory rate as a side effect of anemia. Look for signs of infection as evidence of a low white blood cell count. Assess the abdomen for any enlargement of the liver or the spleen. Look at the musculoskeletal system for overall, you know, weakness. Um, and then paresthesias, so tingling of the hands would be a sign of something like B12 deficiency. And then just kind of overall neuro um, altered mental status, changes in mentation, uh, changes in um, personality. The nurse needs to analyze the blood work of the patient and then correlate it with what they're seeing clinically. We're going to look at the erythrocytes, the red blood cell count, the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, and the reticulocyte count. Reticulocytes are immature red blood cells that circulate in the bloodstream for about two days before they become mature oxygen-carrying red blood cells. When um, reticulocyte count is elevated, that means that the body is able to create more red blood cells, uh, and that's good when you've given something like Procrit or Epigen, and if the reticulocyte count is low, then that means that the bone marrow is not creating enough red blood cells. When you look at the white blood cell count, you're going to look at the total white blood cell count. Um, it's normal is you know, four and a half or five to 11. And when it's less than that, four and a half to five, uh, we talk about having leukopenia or low white blood cell count, which puts you at risk for infection. Um, most uh, important in that is the neutrophil count. When somebody has um, an absolute neutrophil count of less than one or 1,000, um, depending on the way you write it out, but the number is one on the count, they are at incredibly high risk for infection and their immune system is very suppressed. And so um, therefore um, they, they need to be on neutropenic precautions. If the neutrophil count is really elevated and the overall white blood cell count is elevated, then you know that the person is actively fighting off an infection or they have extreme inflammation um, but it can also be elevated during times of stress. Other white blood cells that you might see within the differential would be um, eosinophils and basophils. Eosinophils kind of uh, eat up or stop histamine and kill parasites. Basophils release histamine and heparin and aid in the inflammatory response. So uh, eosinophils and basophils almost kind of work against each other. And then lymphocytes and monocytes. And those both work um, in terms of immunity and fighting off um, invasions. So um, lymphocytes uh, will attack, like um, that's part of like your transplant rejection or your um, transfusion uh, reactions. And monocytes are macrophages that eat up, um, you know, uh, debris and, and dead cells and waste uh, within the body. So with the neutrophils, when I have an immature neutrophil, they are called bands. And you can see on the picture on the right here, this is a band and it has kind of a um, connected horseshoe shape uh, nucleus on the inside. When um, the neutrophil matures, it ends up looking like this guy on the far right in the middle slide. And it's very segmented. So when I am doing a differential and looking at a, a slide under the microscope and I am counting the different white blood cells that I see, if I'm cranking out a lot of immature white blood cells, then I'm counting out more cells down here and not as many up here. And so I end up with what we call a left shift because there's more counts down here on the left than there are on the right. So 
that's when you hear the term left shift. It means that there's a lot of immature neutrophils or bands being released into the bloodstream. This is also referred to as bandemia. This is a sig significant in the terms of, um, it means that there's an acute infection rather than just like stress or um, an inflammatory response. Bandemia usually signifies an acute infection. There are certain types of leukemia where you can get a left shift. So um, with chronic myeloid lymph, uh, leukemia and certain acute leukemias, you can get a left shift um, and uh, technically a bandemia, but not every single type of leukemia. Platelets are responsible again for clotting. Uh, that you should have about 150 to 450,000 um, on your blood levels. We really start to worry uh, at about 50 and anywhere from 10 to 20. Um, you know, you're incredibly high risk and need to be treated. So we don't usually transfuse platelets until you get in that 10 to 20 range. Um, but you're very, very high risk at 50 and you shouldn't have anything like, you know, injections or any invasive procedures. But anybody who has a platelet count less than 150 should be assessed uh, for bleeding because that's either very high risk for uh, bleeding. Other labs that relate to clotting and coagulation factors are uh, PT which is our prothrombin time, and that tells us how long it takes for a fibrin clot to form by um, kind of stimulating the extrinsic pathway or the extrinsic um, coagulation pathway. And that utilizes the combination of clotting factors 5, 7, 10, prothrombin, and fibrinogen in the lab. And basically, um, it the PT or the prothrombin um, time is uh, elevated if I'm on Coumadin or Warfarin. Um, so this is extrinsic uh, clotting factors um, or the ones that are kind of uh, impacted by oral anticoagulants. And then the PTT or the partial thromboplastin time or activated partial thromboplastin time, so APTT, is the one that measures the intrinsic pathways or um, you know how well heparin is working. The INR is a conversion of the PT into an international normalized ratio. So the INR doesn't actually measure anything. It's not it's not a lab test in and of itself. Um, it's a conversion of the PT result into a national or international normalized ratio. Other diagnostic tests would include bone marrow aspiration, where we study the bone marrow of a patient to identify the presence of things like leukemia, malignancies, and it can help us determine the causes of anemia. The posterior superior iliac crest is the most common site. It's done under local anesthetic, and um, afterwards you just apply pressure for five to 10 minutes and you can put ice on it if needed for um, any swelling or pain. You wanna monitor for any bleeding and treat for pain, and then teach the patient to watch for signs and symptoms of infection. Age-related changes related to the hematologic system include a decline in bone mass and intracellular fluids, a decrease in blood volume and liver function, so a decrease in things like the production of albumin and other plasma proteins, a decrease in hematopoiesis and iron binding. So as we get older, we're at higher risk for things like anemia, infection, and bleeding. Let's talk about the care of patients with hematologic problems. Our nursing goals are to prevent hypoxia, infection, and bleeding. Anemia is when you have unmet cellular oxygen demands due to a decreased number or impaired function of red blood cells. So either they have a decreased H and H or they have uh, malformed red blood cells, and this leads to cellular hypoxia. A common sign and symptom of anemia is uh, pallor, weakness, fatigue, 
decreased activity tolerance, which means that, you know, when they do their normal activities, they're feeling short of breath or they're, you know, tired. And then tachypnea and dyspnea, but specifically on exertion. So most people who have anemia aren't acutely short of breath at rest, but more with activity. They may have an elevated respiratory rate at rest, but that's just to try to increase oxygenation. Thinking about the term erythema, which is something that you should be familiar with, it means red. Um, using that same base word, uh, erythrocyte means red cell. So a, a red blood cell is an erythrocyte. Erythropoiesis is um, the creation of red blood cells. And it's a very carefully controlled balance of manufacturing red blood cells at the correct rate to match the destruction of red blood cells. Erythropoietin, as I mentioned, is the hormone released by the kidneys in response to hypoxia. So the kidneys sense not enough oxygen. They release erythropoietin that then stimulates the bone marrow, those pluripotent stem cells, to create erythrocytes. So erythropoietin stimulates erythropoiesis in response to hypoxia. Our goal overall with the management of anemia is to have a hemoglobin and hematocrit that's adequate for cellular perfusion and clot formation. But we don't wanna overshoot and cause polycythemia or too many red blood cells because that increases viscosity and slow flowing blood actually does not carry oxygen well or deliver enough oxygen to the tissues. So being dehydrated or having increased or thick viscosity from either too many cells or something like too much glucose actually puts your cells at greater risk of hypoxia. In order to form a red blood cell, you need the correct building blocks. So red blood cell synthesis requires hemoglobin, vitamin B, 12, 9, and 6, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper. And then all of those things are combined together in the bone marrow, again, in kids and the long bones, well, really in all bones, but in adults, in the flat and irregular bones, like the sternum, the ribs, um, the scapula, and the pelvis. And then the stem cells in the red marrow use the hemoglobin and the iron and all those other building blocks, the B vitamins, to make the red blood cells. So the erythrocyte then is born. It comes out as a reticulocyte. It circulates around for two days as it matures. And then for 120 days, roughly, it floats around our bloodstream where it has um, hundreds of thousands of hemoglobin molecules inside this red blood cell. And each one of those hundreds of thousands of hemoglobin molecules can pick up four oxygen molecules. So oxygen binds very loosely. Um, it actually dissolves across the membrane and it's inside the cell. And it binds loosely so that it can dissociate very easily when it reaches a cell that needs oxygen. Um, it binds to carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide with a much higher affinity so that um, those, you know, uh, waste products essentially don't release and go to other cells and, and kind of suffocate them. So the hope is that we'll be able to carry it back to the lungs and kind of breathe it off. After 120 days, um, it, the cells degenerate enough, like the cell walls start to break down, that the spleen, the liver, and the tissues will kind of destroy them. And then let the hemoglobin and the iron um, get recycled. Uh, the bilirubin gets filtered out by the liver and becomes bile, and the cycle starts again for this um, beautiful little cell. Anemia then can result from a poor diet or a malabsorption. Not enough red blood cells are produced. And problems like chronic alcoholism tend to be at the top of the list for why this happens, because the person doesn't eat a good diet. So um, all of our vitamin B deficiencies have chronic alcoholism as a huge factor, um, but also iron deficiency would have chronic alcoholism as a factor because the person isn't getting adequate intake. Iron deficiency anemia is microcytic, meaning that it has a mean corpuscle volume that is small. Um, B12 and uh, folic acid deficiencies are macrocytic, meaning on the lab value, the MCV or the mean corpuscular volume is going to be um, elevated or large.
Why that's important is because we treat it differently. So when you get your red blood cell count and you're looking and your, your hemoglobin and hematocrit are low and your person is fatigued and you look at the MCV, if it's low, it's an iron deficiency anemia and they need iron. And if it's high, you need to do more testing to determine if it's a B12 or folic acid deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia presents with fissures in the corner of the mouth, glossitis, chylonicheas, which are when you get this like flat and then spoon-shaped fingernails. The person is, you know, again, pallor, fatigue, activity, intolerance. Um, you need to monitor for bleeding because in adults, GI bleed is the number one cause. In kids, it's usually nutrition related. If you're going to give iron supplementation, Iron needs vitamin C in order to be absorbed. So giving, like mixing it with juice or giving it with juice is great. Um, it needs to be kind of between meals, but ideally on an empty stomach, not with a snack. And you can't give it with um, like milk, dairy, or calcium products because that binds to the iron and makes it unavailable for the body to absorb. Uh, Patients who've had like a partial gastrectomy or who have GI bleeds are at higher risk for uh, iron deficiency anemia as well. Um, patients should avoid antacids if they have iron deficiency anemia because of the buffering of the iron and the inability um, to absorb it. The B um, deficiency, vitamin B deficiency anemias, again, are macrocytic. Vitamin B12 um, can also develop that glossitis, that beefy red tongue, but the big thing is neurological. So paresthesias, this tingling of the hands and the feet, visual disturbances, um, neuro changes, confusion, depression, and then even altered mental status. This can come from poor nutrition if I'm just not eating the right foods, but it also can come from what's called pernicious anemia, where I lack the intrinsic factor in my gut. Um, so like uh, either autoimmune parietal related, or I had like gastric bypass or some sort of cancer or you know medication related, and I can no longer absorb B12 through my stomach. And so if I have just a dietary related B12, I need to take B12 supplementation. If I have pernicious anemia, I need B12 injections. So I can't take it um, enterally, I need the parenteral. The reason that I said that if I have a macrocytic anemia or my mean corpuscle volume is elevated, that I need to do more testing is because um, the red blood cell, if I supplement with folic acid, my red blood cells will become um, a normal number again. So I'll increase my red blood cell production if I just increase my folate. So even if I can't absorb B12, if I take folic acid, I won't be anemic anymore, but the neurological damage will still be occurring and I can end up with permanent neurological damage from chronic B12 deficiency. So it's really critical that you diagnose correctly the type of deficiency that you have before you start treating it. Folic acid, again, macrocytic, presents with the kind of classic signs and symptoms of anemia, the fatigue, the pallor, the activity intolerance. Um, in some ways it mimics the B12, but it doesn't have like the neurological stuff. Um, it does create neural tube defects if you have a folic acid deficiency during pregnancy, as well as some facial defects. It's important to identify patients who are at risk and supplement and educate them. Um, and treatment, again, will reverse anemia. It's usually very effective, but be very careful that you're sure that it's not a B12 deficiency first. Alcoholism currently is one of the greatest risk factors for uh, folic acid deficiency. Uh, in our community. Um, you can have anemia as the result of bone marrow disease, and we refer to this as kind of like um, a plastic anemia, where the bone marrow function is impaired, and this results in what we call pancytopenia, where um, like none of the cells are um, created enough so there's too little of all cells in the blood so we end up with anemia too few red blood cells the pallor the fatigue the dyspnea the activity intolerance 
we end up with leukopenia, which is too few red, white blood cells, and they're at risk for infection. Um, and so they uh, experience frequent infections. And then we end up with thrombocytopenia, which is too few platelets, and they're at risk for bleeding. So we look for petechiae, bleeding gums, and hematuria. Uh, nursing care really focuses on, again, infection control, injury prevention, and then blood transfusions as needed. Uh, lots of education on hand hygiene, and if the person is neutropenic, then those reverse precautions or enhanced isolation. We can also have anemia as a result of genetic disorders um, or anything where we have enhanced destruction of red blood cells. So they're either formed incorrectly uh, and or destroyed too quickly. So something like um, sickle cell disease would be an example of an anemia that has enhanced destruction of the red blood cells. Um, this is an autosomal recessive um, disease that occurs usually in people who are from tropical Africa, uh, where you have sickle-shaped uh, hemoglobin and the red blood cells are very fragile and carry less oxygen, which means that they're easily destroyed um, and they cause uh, clots and thrombus uh, in small vessels throughout the body. The patient presents with uh, joint pain, um, an S3 with increased cardiac output. Jaundice is very common. So you'll notice with these where you have increased red blood cell destruction that you have the added sign and symptom of jaundice because you're having an increased um, destruction. So you have increased uh, release of bilirubin into the bloodstream and the liver just can't keep up. Um, priapism and splenomegaly are possible. And with a splenomegaly, you have what's called a sequestration syndrome, where um, the, like the spleen gets all sequestered or plugged up with the fragments of the sickled cells that are breaking down. You can also have acute vasoocclusive crisis, where you have um, the clots or the thrombus that uh, plug up areas of the circulation and that causes that cascade of kind of hypoxia, ischemia, infarct, and necrosis. Our major goals are um, oxygen and fluids because things like hypoxia, especially from dehydration, tend to trigger a um, sickle crisis. And then pain management is very important to help the person relax and teach and promote safety. So you wanna teach about decreasing the risk of infection, decreasing venous stasis. Um, pregnancy enhances sickle crisis as well as the use of alcohol and any fever, stress, or altitude can enhance sickle crisis as well. It's critical to teach parents of children with sickle cell disease to have their children seen as soon as possible um, if the child starts to develop a fever, a, a cough, um, even just a cold, because even a viral respiratory illness that seems like nothing um, to someone who doesn't have this can create an acute sickle crisis uh, for a, a child or an adult. Um, G6PD is a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase sex links deficiency where there's a, an enzyme that's deficient and the enzyme um, diminishes as the cells age and send the, the cells cell walls break down and you just have kind of like this um, uh, auto hemolysis the cells just kind of rupture as they're going in transit uh, so we see a lot of um, jaundice the treatment for this is hydration to prevent acute kidney injury um, we can use mannitol as an osmotic diuretic and then a blood transfusion if needed for severe anemia. The goal is just to um, avoid triggers with something like a G6PD attack. And then we have um, our hemolytic anemias, and these can be immune or um, these could be uh, other things like a transfusion reaction. But basically, the immune system targets and lyses red blood cells um, for whatever reason. And um, you present again with the jaundice, the spleen often becomes enlarged, the liver can become enlarged. The person may develop gallstones from all of the bilirubin that the poor liver is trying to filter out of um, the system. 
And we treat that with things like steroids and then um, plasmapheresis or apheresis, where we're actually trying to clean or filter some of this out of the bloodstream, including trying to filter some of these um, immune agents out of the bloodstream. And last but not least in this category are our extrinsic factors. So not part of our body, but kind of in our body. Things like um, left ventricular assist devices, intra-aortic balloon pumps, certain medications, and hemodialysis all increase the turbulence with which red blood cells are going through or by the vascular system. And that uh, increases the damage to the surface of the cells, which decreases the lifespan of the cells. So this is actually a form of um, extrinsic anemia or um, anemia that results from destruction of the red blood cells due to external forces. And it's uh, jaundice, classic signs and symptoms of anemia. It's, um, it, you know, you do the appropriate treatment and monitor H&H, &H, um, monitor the oxygen and CO2 levels. But really, your nursing care is just appropriate for that patient and that presentation. And then when possible, you would remove the offending problem. But if somebody needs a left ventricular assist device, you're not going to take it out because then they won't have a pulse. So, um, you know, uh, it's kind of a toss up of well, which one's the worst. And obviously not having a pulse is going to be worse than having a low H&H. &H. Um, so they may then get treatment like you know, uh, Procrit, like epigen, or they might get um, transfusions, or we might just increase their diet um, for like B vitamins and iron, or we might just keep an eye on it. So let's talk about then, though that was anemia, which was too few red blood cells. Let's talk about polycythemia, which is too many uh, red blood cells. So polycythemia or polycythemia vera is a disease where the body makes too many red blood cells. The blood becomes too thick, the viscosity is increased, and on top of having slow sluggish circulation, which decreases oxygen transport, we also have malformed red blood cells that don't carry oxygen well, and they cause um, kind of uh, thrombus or clots in small vessels. So we have kind of this triple whammy of being um, thick and sluggish, we have clots and obstructions, and then we have malformed red blood cells that don't carry oxygen well. So the, the patient has a pretty significant peripheral hypoxia as well as they can have central hypoxia. Um, and again, this leads to this cascade of hypoxia, so um, low oxygen in the cellular at the cellular level, and then anoxia, which means no oxygen at the cellular level, so ischemia, and then infarct, which means um, cell death, and then necrosis is when the cell ruptures and, um, you know, the, the factors, the uh, tissue necrosis factors are released, and it starts to kind of liquefy um, the cells around it, and it in increases or enlarges the area of cellular destruction. The heart, the spleen, and the kidneys are at greatest risk for damage from polycythemia vera. The treatment is therapeutic phlebotomy where they take off about a unit a week at first until the person has a normal H&H &H and then as needed. Um, apheresis is another, again, it's like uh, similar to dialysis, but they're hooking you up and, and removing the cells that they want to remove. And then um, hydration is critical. Oral hydration, you want them drinking about three liters of fluid a day. It's not IV fluid, it's oral fluid to keep them well hydrated um, and to prevent um, any additional dehydration or anything else that's going to, you know, kind of mess with the viscosity of the blood. You want to promote venous return. So um, nothing that's like, uh, you know, no tight clothing, no tight waistbands. Um, anticoagulants are helpful to prevent those small clots or small thrombi. They should stop smoking and they should stay warm to prevent vascular spasm, especially in the periphery. Leukemia is the cancer of the white blood cells. And this is an abundance of immature, ineffective white blood cells in the bone marrow. So we think about leukemia thinking like, oh, we don't have enough white blood cells. That's really not the case with leukemia. I actually have way too many white blood cells, but they're ineffective, immature white blood cells. So I have this huge outpouring of 
um, ineffective white cells. Depending on the type of leukemia, it might be uh, lymphocytes or it might be bands, but I have lots of uh, immature white blood cells. Um, since these white blood cells are overcrowding the bone marrow, I also have a decrease in red blood cells and platelets as well. The person with leukemia does not have an adequate number of mature neutrophils, so it's possible to have a you know ton of um, white blood cells throughout the body without an adequate number of neutrophils to fight off infection. So it's important that we avoid things like skin injuries, um, unnecessary you know vena punctures or skin tears or wounds. Avoid rectal temps or suppositories, which can cause an abscess and sepsis. With the anemia, they're going to see the pallor, the fatigue, the dyspnea, and the decreased activity tolerance. A nursing intervention that's super helpful is to cluster care to prevent increased fatigue and shortness of breath. And then with the thrombocytopenia, again, you're looking for petechiae, bleeding, gums, hematuria, um, but there are potential for bleeding internally that you can't see, so you need to monitor the CBC to watch for a decrease in the H and H to rule out occult bleeding, like a slow GI bleed or something like that. The treatment for leukemia includes chemotherapy, radiation, and bone marrow transplant. Chemotherapy results in things like stomatitis, so oral pain. Um, you need to provide gentle daily mouth care, soft, bland foods, and hydration. It also increases pancytopenia, so there are ris risk for bleeding, infection, fatigue, and dyspnea. So the chemotherapy worsens the pancytopenia. Radiation will increase the fatigue, so it's important that we really help them learn how to conserve their energy and provide great skin care. Radiation does not burn the skin, but it can cause some localized irritation. And then bone marrow transplants. And with bone marrow transplants, you want to provide pain management and then the same things, looking for bleeding and infection. So just like with the bone marrow aspiration, bone marrow transplant, you have the same kind of risk factors, pain, bleeding, and infection. You um, should see an increase in white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets in about three weeks. And that means that the bone marrow transplant has engrafted and the person is getting better. However, if you see just an increase in white blood cells, that may mean that they've developed an infection. So keep a careful eye on their blood work. The person who has an absolute neutrophil count of 1,000 or less um, should be placed on neutropenic precautions. No raw fruits or veggies, no plants or flowers, no standing water, avoid crowds, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, and reverse isolation. Myelodysplastic syndromes, are when we have a problem with um, our uh, bone marrow, and again, it causes pancytopenia, so too few of all cells in the blood due to bone marrow dysfunction. We have anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. So we have um, our pallor fatigue and dyspnea, chronic hypoxia that can lead to clubbing. And we know that if we're thinking that it's chronic hypoxia, it should be present in all four extremities. It should be on the fingernails and the toenails. If I look and my patient only has clubbing on the toenails, then I think that the patient has you know, um, lower extremity arterial insufficiency. The drug of choice to treat anemias is um, a, a replacement of um, erythropoietin. So uh, epoietin or um, uh, so epigen or procrit, um, so epoetin or darpoetin. Leukemia is when we have too few white blood cells, frequent infections. Again, neutropenia is when we have an absolute neutrophil count of 1,000 or less, and you have no, low neutrophils, increased risk for infection, and you want to give a neutrophil stimulator like neupogen or leukine. The important thing to remember with that is when you're using a colony stimulating factor, it can't be given within 24 hours of chemotherapy or some sort of myelosuppressant because they'll cancel each other out. And then thrombocytopenia is when we don't have enough platelets and there's an increased risk for bleeding. Avoid unnecessary vena punctures, monitor H&H, &H, and then use your platelet stimulators like Numega or N-plate, um, which is used for uh, thrombocytopenia. Idiopathic.
All right, so let's talk about those. Um, so thrombocyte disorders or clotting problems are um, ITP and TTP. So we have um, idiopathic thrombocytopenia uh, purpura and thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. And idiopathic is also called autoimmune. This is when there's an increased destruction of thrombocytes by the spleen for um, an autoimmune reason. So the spleen is recognizing your thrombocytes or your platelets as not being yours. Um, the treatment for that is immunosuppression or telling the spleen to knock it off, basically. So you're suppressing the immune function of the spleen, but that means that you're suppressing the immune function of your entire immune system and lymphatic system throughout your body, which puts you at really high risk for infection. Platelet transfusion is only used for life-threatening bleeding. Um, and uh, so our goal then has to be safety and bleeding precautions. The splenectomy may be necessary and you need to monitor for post-op bleeding. The thing to remember is if we take out your spleen when you have um, life-threatening thrombocytopenia, you are an incredibly high risk for hemorrhage and your spleen is in your abdomen where you can lose up to two liters of blood before we even notice that you're bleeding. So you wanna look for gross hemorrhage externally, but you also wanna look for um, you know, abdominal uh, distension um, or any like retroperitoneal bruising. Uh, and then look at your vital signs. Are they tachycardic? Are they tachypnic? Um, you know, is there uh, uh, blood pressure dropping? Um, and monitor their labs really closely. Thrombotic thrombocytic purpura is when you use up your available platelets and um, then you just don't have any available to you uh, in times of like trauma or injury and you can't clot. Um, so it's not hemophilia, but it presents kind of similarly. So when you're injured, you can't actually take care of yourself, protect yourself or clot off. So hemophilia is a genetic deficiency of an actual clotting factor. So you probably have normal platelet counts and normal red blood cell counts and you have normal albumin and you know, everything else is normal, but in that clotting cascade, you know, you're missing one of those factors and each factor triggers the next step in the clotting cascade. So when you're deficient in one, the clotting cascade doesn't work. And so we have intrinsic and extrinsic clotting factors that um, people can be deficient in, but, um, you know, the, the, the problem is that with hemophilia, they tend to be the extrinsic ones. Um, that people are deficient in, which are the ones that can't stop, um, like the the damage, like tissue damage from clots, uh, cuts, and and uh, lacerations and and surgery. So bleeding is very slow to stop, even teeny tiny minor cuts. And for um, us, education is really critical. So we want to teach parents about how to avoid injury in kids. Uh, we want to talk to them about, um, you know, how to have like healthy, safe play. Um, you want to teach them about the care of injuries. So if they fall and they hit a joint, it's rest, ice, compression, elevation, Tylenol for pain, never aspirin, not really ibuprofen. That's not going to be ideal. So Tylenol and then opiates for severe pain. So these are kids where we would prescribe opiates, kind of PRN for pain rather than uh, ibuprofen. Um, IM injections and immunizations are okay for the person with hemophilia, but not for the person who has severe thrombocytopenia, right? So the difference is that um, uh, with hemophilia, they still need their immunizations, they still need their IM injections, um, and uh, this is going to be like a lifelong thing. The you know with somebody who has thrombocytopenia, we want to get them to a point where it's safe to inject them and not cause these massive hematomas. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT is a, an immune-mediated response that occurs after um, somebody has received heparin, like hep repeat doses of heparin flush, uh, which is why we switch to saline flushes, and that stimulates the clotting cascade. So it's kind of like a um, idiosyncratic reaction to heparin, and it can cause um, DVTs and PEs. So the treatment is a direct thrombin inhibitor like um, Argatraban or Angiomax, which is bivalirudin.
Lymphomas are cancers of the lymph nodes, and lymphoma is um, kind of split into two categories, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. The difference is on a biopsy of the lymph node, whether or not the biopsy shows Reed Sternberg cells. So Hodgkin's has Reed Sternberg cells, and non-Hodgkin's, there's no Reed Sternberg cells. The lymph nodes in Hodgkin's are usually, usually start in the upper body and spread in a very predictable pattern. These are swollen, painless, um, rubbery fixed nodes. The person experiences things like weight loss, night sweats, persistent fever and malaise, cough, dyspnea, chest pain, recurrent infections, itching, and the spleen oftentimes becomes enlarged. With non-Hodgkin's, again, no Reed Sternberg cells, metastasis is common, but the spread is very disorganized. So oftentimes we catch it much later. It has the same signs and symptoms as Hodgkin's, um, but uh, is much harder to treat. So the prognosis is much worse. It has the same um, uh, kind of diagnosis. So we biopsy the nodes, we wanna stage the progression. Um, oftentimes we have to do a lot of testing just to determine how far it has spread and to determine what the best course of action is. So chemo, radiation, and surgery are options for both. Um, and risk factors for lymphoma are things like HIV and immunosuppression. So somebody who has had um, a uh, organ transplant is on immuno immunosuppressants, somebody who's received chemotherapy and um, that's an immunosuppressant, or somebody who's on chronic like um, immunosuppressant or immune, immune modulating drugs like rheumatoid arthritis, um, psori psoriasis. Um, there, there's actually a lot of them out there, but um, I, those are the ones that are coming up on the top of my head right now. Those types of medications, um, just think about those are the ones that are going to, to um, put the person at increased risk of developing a lymphoma later on in life. Multiple myeloma is cancer of the B lymphocytes, and these circulate around in the plasma, so it's also referred to as kind of cancer of the plasma cells. So it's an overabundance of these B lymphocytes um, that uh, crowd the bone marrow, and um, because they're crowding the bone marrow, then the pluripotent stem cells can no longer make um, the uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, or the platelets. And so instead, it's just selecting for these B lymphocytes. The cancer then starts to invade the bone. It creates these very painful tumors. And as the bone starts to break down, the calcium is released into the bloodstream. So the person develops um, hypercalcemia, which can cause acute kidney injuries. And as the bones demineralize, pathological fractures are very common. Um, pain is a huge issue with multiple myeloma. Treatment includes things like chemotherapy, which can put the person into remission but is not curative, or radiation, which is really like palliative. It can shrink tumors, but again, not curative. There is no surgery because these are cells, so there's nothing that you can like actually remove. Um, they could remove, you know, a tumor technically, um, but that's not it's not curative, again, it would be palliative. So pain management really is, um, is the treatment and there, there's no cure for multiple myeloma. And blood transfusions. <clears throat> so we've talked about blood transfusions or blood product transfusions as being um, part of some of the treatment for these things. So let's just talk about for a second the, the role of the nurse in administering um, blood or blood products. So the first thing is that you need to make sure that you have an order and that you have a signed consent in the chart by the patient and the physician. It is the responsibility of the physician to consent the patient, not the nurse. You want to explain the signs and symptoms of a transfusion reaction to the patient if the patient is able to understand, um, but remember that you can still transfuse patients without explaining the signs and symptoms to them um, if they are like obtunded or um, you know, cognitively uh, don't, can't understand. 
you obtain the blood or someone obtains the blood from the blood bank and then when you get it you look for the color which should be this dark red as you see in the picture um, any clumping any gas bubbles and you always want to check the expiration date and time to make sure that it is still good you should wear gloves while you're handling blood even though it's sealed in there it is blood um, and it is possible that things will leak Normal saline is the only compatible fluid, and you need to use filtered tubing to prevent any clots from reaching the patient. So you'll get your normal saline and your filtered tubing and uh, go to the bedside. At the bedside, again, you're going to use two unique patient identifiers. Can you tell me your name and date of birth? And you need another licensed person, ideally another RN or possibly LPN at the bedside. The two of you are then going to check the blood and the patient to verify the blood bag ID, the patient ID, the ABO and RH factors, um, the expiration date, and the time again. So you're going to compare everything and then you both sign off on the blood. Right before you start, you're going to take the uh, patient's vital signs and record them and uh, prime the uh, filtered blood tubing with saline, then spike the blood begin the infusion and remain with the patient for a minimum of 15 minutes. The RN has to stay at the bedside. There's absolutely no exceptions to that. You can't step out for a minute. You can't answer the phone. You can't answer a call bell. None of those things. You got to stay there with the patient. Record the vital signs, uh, Q 15 minutes per your facility policy. And, um, you know, then, uh, you know, you can, per your facility policy, delegate the rest of the blood vital signs to somebody else. During the transfusion, if there's any signs of a reaction, you need to stop the transfusion, disconnect the tubing, and flush with a different saline bag, and then call the physician. So you can't flush with a saline bag that was hung and spiked through the blood tubing because that will flush in more of the blood that the person's having a reaction to. Don't administer things like Benadryl, epinephrine, whatever, without an order. Um, you know, so follow your, your policy for your facility. Once the transfusion is complete, you need to record the time that was completed, the volume that was administered, the vital signs of the patient, and then the blood bag and the tubing get sent back to the lab for post-transfusion testing. And the lab is really diligent about checking it to make sure that nothing grows in it and that it truly was the right blood type and that there were no other, you know, funky pieces or parts hanging out in the blood. So they do a pre-check and then they do a post-check just for quality control. So that is a quick rundown of the hematologic system. Um, and as always, thank you for watching.